Welcome everybody to checkyourgame.com. I'm excited. I say the same thing over and over again. I'm excited because I always am excited because I love people and I love talking to people. And uh, I've got a new guest with me. Her name is Susan Brown. I'm excited. Susan, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, that's awesome. And Susan, she does a bunch of different things. She does have a book um, I think it's an online book. Is that right? Or it's it's actually in book form. You can purchase that as well. There might be a few physical copies left on Amazon. Yeah. And we have some in a local bookstore. We've gone to more digital so we could bundle it and yeah. make it more affordable and accessible for the masses. So she's an author and, it, and their book is called One Year of Thankful Thursdays. And you know what? I wish we were doing this on Thursday, but we're not. It's a Monday, but that's okay. Maybe we'll post the story on Thursday. She's got a book. She's got, um, she's a, has a website, the 365 family.com. It's T H E. Then the numbers 365 family.com. And she's a mother. She's a wife. She's a, a business owner. She does has, she does a lot of stuff. In fact, I'm going to let her share some more details about her and then we're going to get into the interview. So welcome again. Hey, thanks, Gary. And I'm the same. I feel like you and I could chat forever because I just love people. And there's something so amazing about this great big world and all of our diversity and that um, God somehow in every single person on the planet has put an image of himself. So the more we get to know people, it's like really like the more we're getting to know God and see so many different uh, parts of him. And so it's exciting. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. What Susan, is there anything I missed from a little bit about your background that I that you can share? Um, you mean as far as like what I do now or just going about like Yeah, family, anything with your family. Is that right? You have three My you have husband three. Yeah. and two beautiful daughters, ages twelve and fourteen, a coon hound who thinks he's the size of a Yorkie, whose favorite thing to do is crawl his sixty pounds up on your chest and lay there. Aww. He's wonderful. And a leopard gecko and guinea pigs. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> Wow. No, we don't have land. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I see, I see lizards every day outside and you have to keep them caged up probably, but, <laughs> but that's pretty cool. Um, are those your kids, your kids as animals or? They are, they are. And I'm a homeschool mom and I have a booth inside of a local antique shop where I do a lot of mix of rustic and glam. And my kids actually have their own jewelry business and um, they sell, they ship and do custom stuff, but they also sell it in my booth and then I enjoy writing and meeting people like you. So we have the blog, which I started basically as a means of when guys are open my eyes that, wow, I'm not the only one that's been, that's fallen into this trap that Satan weaves so well of you're nothing, you're not good enough. You need to shut up and sit down. And yeah. the more I talk to people, which is something I love to do, like I know you do, my eyes were opened and God kept laying this on my heart, laying this on my heart. People keep asking me what I, start something and so after praying about it and arguing about it with God you know ultimately he had his way and so that's how the blog was born yeah. and we named it the 365 family because we it was basically for the every family encouragement and practical simple solutions that work for you 365 days of the year so whether your family is you alone with the pet married with the spouse you know, divorced, widowed, whatever that looks like, you know, they're all welcome here and just all a part of that everyday routine. And yeah, that's great. And everybody we're going to, um, um, Susan's going to have a business card on the, on the bottom of her profile. So if you're watching her video online, just scroll down, you can connect with her, find out about her website and all that stuff. But um, I wanted to let people know how I even got to know you, Susan, because at Check Your Game, what we do is we share stories of overcoming adversity, but what we're doing is we're including, we're bragging about God, whether it's somebody's testimony or how God brought them through the tough times. That's what we're doing. And I'm excited to be doing this with you, Susan, but I first, so I have this little process where people share stories and they nominate others. And so Thank you, Wendy Wallace, for nominating Susan. She loves you. We talked about you a little bit earlier. And um, thank you, Wendy, um, for nominating Susan. But Susan, so like we do at Check Your Game, I ask people two questions and you can share, you know, some more details, you know, over the Zoom. But I ask people about sharing their Check Your Game moment, or sometimes it's a process. And like we talked earlier, 
before we want to check our game, before we want to examine our game of life, usually something has to happen and it's not good. Usually something is taken away. It's a loss. It, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, kind of like for myself, I had this rock bottom, you know, and, but what is it? Um, and so we, so basically people share, you know, um, what is that moment? Do you have a moment? I was asking you earlier, do you have a moment that took place that just shook you a little bit for you to make changes? Now, really, these moments just don't come like that. Something leads up to them. So I'm not sure if you, what you want to share right now, but maybe you want to go in the back, you know, in the past and your upbringing and where you grew up to lead us to that moment. But it's, it's all yours. Thank you, Gary. And it is such a pleasure to get to chat with you before meet you. And I can't wait to connect with all the other check your gamers. And, <laughs> um, and like Gary said, I hope that as you listen to me, I don't want you to be um, impressed with me or really even like me. This is all about God and all of our fingers pointing to him, everything in our life pointing to him. So anything good or exciting or stories of redemption and hope, uh, you know, let's keep our eyes fixed on the Lord because he's the author of it all. And so um, I'm just forever grateful. I was uh, telling uh, you earlier, Gary, that I think what's really exciting when I think about heaven is I know for a fact that there are going to be people that are genuinely surprised to see me in heaven mm. because of who I used to be. And, you know, I just, I don't know them anymore because I've lived all these different places for whatever yeah. reason. So they might not know I have changed, might not know who I am. Right. Yeah. And I think what's really exciting about that too, is from my perspective, I know that because God works the way he does, there's guaranteed to be people in my life and in your life and everybody's life that we're genuinely surprised to see in heaven. And that's a good thing. That's a God thing because that's how he works, right? Yeah. So my story is a little bit, I mean, it's not a little bit, it's a long winded one because I like to tell people I'm that one that God's grabbed a hold of like, Susan, do you hear me down there? Hello. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like the slow burn knocking me over the head harder and harder. Yeah. But it's interesting, you know, when you're talking about those rock bottoms and it's always uh, a bit shocking to me when people wonder how the people that have had some of the hardest stuff happen in life can be the most joyful because to me it's so obvious right if we think of God um, he is never a God of contradictions let's make that clear right he's that's not who he is but he is a God of opposites think of it like this he left perfection to come to imperfection mm. He left the riches of more than anything anybody here can fathom times a gazillion to come be the lowest and the poorest, right? And when you think about our own spiritual walk and how it's supposed to look, I think a lot of us, and understandably so, because it's the unknown, right? The one thing we can never know here on earth is what it's like to die. It only is going to happen to us one time, right? Like we know what birthdays are like once we have one, we know what, you know, marriage is or celebration or getting ready for work, all those things that we come used to. So it's understandable that there would be a little bit of trepidation, even for the Christian, like, oh no, the fear of the unknown, so to speak. But I think what's really interesting, and I just lost my train of thought when we got her back, mm -hmm. is that when you think of um, death as a Christian, yeah. it really is, if we think of the anachronym, it's the doorway to eternity of all things him so it's not something to be afraid of obviously not something we're going to run towards because you know in his timing but i just think that it's an interesting um paradigm that we think that the suffering can't happen because you know his whole mission here when he came here was to teach teach and then to die so that we might have life so there's another opposite that's where i was going yeah. um but i think as people we don't want to be forgotten right but if yeah. we think of our spiritual life in opposites, we need to be okay with being forgotten by people to be remembered by him. We need to be okay with um, being injured so we can be healed. We need to learn to be okay with being broken so we can be made whole. So if you think of all those terms of how God works in opposites, and honestly, it makes so much sense because how would we know God unless we had a need for him, right? If you and I, Gary, and if all the people in the world, everything was always perfect, right? Mm. 
Um, nothing bad ever happened. Nobody ever hurt anybody. Nobody ever said a crossword, which of course we know is impossible, but let's just imagine it. Basically it was Adam and Eve in the garden, right? And all of us like to think, oh, we wouldn't have taken that apple. Yeah, we would have. Yeah. Um, but here's the interesting thing is that if we have no suffering, if we have no pain, then we don't need to reach outside of ourselves for anything. Then we become our own God. We basically think we have it all together. Everything is okay. I need nothing else. So it's so clear, really, when people say why is there suffering in the world, so that we can know we need God, right? And um, and I'll just share this real quick. I shared with you earlier, when I think of suffering, because I love an acronyms, is um, this was laid on my heart. When I think of suffering, it's a softening us for further eternal reaching in needing God, right? And it really is like, it's softening us for just that constant reaching and needing him, that constant acknowledgement of denial of ourself and reaching for him. So when people are hesitant to share their stories or their pain and suffering, I think it kind of really does a disservice to Jesus ultimately because he suffered the ultimate and the whole point was for redemption, right? So he is not a God of contradictions. He simply isn't. I would never say that. No believer, I know. But if we think of how he works in terms of opposites, we wouldn't need God if we didn't know suffering. And how would we know what light is if everything was always dark? You wouldn't know what light is. So we have to have the darkness to know what light is, right? So I just want to encourage people with that before I share my story that there is no amount of darkness that he can't just shatter immediately with his unbreakable light, you know? Um, anyway, so everybody has a story. I want to encourage everybody watching that your story and my stories, they all matter and you need to share your story. It doesn't matter if you think your story is irrelevant. I think everybody thinks that in their mind. We all think, ah, oh, whatever. But that's just Satan playing the mind game. Share your stories, people. You don't know how long you have. You don't know what part of your story God will reach to touch somebody's heart and just use for what he always meant it for. So I encourage you. Um, anyway, so here's, is that kind of a good little uh, nugget of leading into the story? Yeah, no, that's great. In fact, I, I mean, I'm processing that. I'm going to have to watch, well, I'm going to be watching this video later, but there's a lot going on in there, but it's all true. I love what you shared and, you know, I'm not going to try to break all that down, you know, but um, that's great. <laughs> I'm just excited because I, w I can't wait to hear what you, because you're talking about people in heaven are going to be surprised. Susan, <laughs> what? Okay, let's are you get kidding this. me? Like, well, and look, you know, another opposite thing, think about this. So uh we have to be um thirsty so we'll go to the water to drink right we have to be hungry so he can fill us like yeah. it is a game of opposites right yeah. really um anyway sorry okay yes yeah, so yeah so uh, these sorry. so so these men and women up in heaven they're like like wondering what how what happened right i mean i'm ho i'm hoping i'm hoping that they're there too when i say that maybe i'm even saying i'm just surprised that i'm gonna be there because of my yeah. story you know yeah. But I do feel like that's true in a lot of people's case. And I do hope and pray. I pray. I'm like, oh, God, let me be surprised. You know, mm. save this person as radically as you saved me. Um, okay. So anyway, I grew up in a little tiny town in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. And when I say the middle of nowhere, the nearest town, the nearest big city was two and a half hours away. And we didn't get a Walmart until I was in college. So we had a Fred's and we had a Kroger. And we had a movie theater for a time. But, you know. And so sometimes, not always, so I hope this is not offensive, sometimes in small towns is small minds, meaning if there's not a whole lot to do and they kind of decide who you are going to be in the school system, if you have, if your parents have money or if you don't, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I was always just this kid that was just, I was kind of like, just happy to be there. I was like this kind of eager puppy. I just love life, love people, right? Yeah. And then, um, then school happened and I was bullied a lot I was that very awkward like not attractive skinny kind of gangly skinny didn't really know how to dress myself had cystic acne bushy hair you know it was just I was just awkward but I was still just a very happy kid I just loved learning although I wasn't necessarily good in school um 
And I just, I loved people. I was, my dog was my best friend though, because Aww. school became increasingly hard because of the bullying. It got worse through junior high and through high school. And I ended up just really, I couldn't wait to get to college because I wanted to quote, reinvent myself. I was sick of it all. Mm. It was horrible, you know, but I mean, we all know that like, right. Kids are some of the worst to each other. I'm not sure why, you know, mm. um, but even back then, and I still in this way, I always was like cheering for people. I'm like, oh, yay, they're, they're winning. Let's go. You know, it's kind of like when little Johnny starts to walk as a toddler. Why is that? Because everybody was cheering for him, right? Yeah. Why is it as we get older that we're like, oh, no, you wanna, you shouldn't do that. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. Oh, you're not good enough for that. No, we got to keep cheering for each other. You know, it doesn't make you somehow insignificant or that your dreams don't matter it's not about us it's about you know oh yay they're doing great encouragement so is really... encouraging encouragement is so important um uh, people i mean i know i need to be encouraged but like just all people in fact it says in the bible um therefore encourage one another lift one another up just as you're doing um that's one of my memorized verses but it's so important that we encourage one another and not to um cut into your story but you're talking about you like you kind of like we're like I can't wait to get to college but let me ask you I don't know if you're going to the college days but what's your what was the church or the, what was your uh, your faith upbringing like during all those days were you were you a believer did you go to church did you accept Jesus was yeah what was going on with that so okay good question so it was interesting I do remember at a young age like knowing I love Jesus and accepting him early on and I really did really wanted to live for him and my parents took us to church um very much all the time it was a reformed church it was a good church and um but you know at home and I'm not going to get into too much of this there was a there was legalism you know and so it was very confusing for me because we'd go to this church where the gospel was being preached good things and I did enjoy church and I did like it yeah. and you know of course, it's always interesting as a parent and adult yourself, looking back, you realize, wow, how much am I going to screw up my own kids that they'll need to talk about, you know, so I don't fault my parents all for any of this, but there was, um, you know, there's just quite a bit of, you know, legalism and strictness um, that wasn't coherent with the church. And as I look back now, I realize it was because what a lot of people went through was the whole we have you have to look good out in public you can't do this 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 like it was very you know um trying to think the worst is rules it was very very much rules but it was like don't don't make us look bad blah 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 don't talk about this outside of that kind of thing you know and again i mean i love my parents you know they love me i wouldn't necessarily say that we had a family where you could talk about things openly but i knew that they loved the lord and I knew like if I was in trouble, they would help me, you know, and um, they took me to church and I did love the Lord. And as I got into college, I'm just not quite sure what happened, but I already knew I was angry and I would like to say it was from the bullying, but really, you know, I mean, adversity and suffering and stuff, it really doesn't build character or reveals it. So um, it was, I'm sure, revealing my own sin of anger. And so um nobody even though it was in the same town I was on the collegiate swim team so wow. I had a swim team scholarship and so it was a whole new group of people they didn't know my background they didn't know that I was this awkward weird kid who was teased and bullied and was a nobody in my you know we didn't have a lot of money they didn't know that so I could just reinvent myself yeah that's great and so to fit in hey oh you're gonna go drinking i'll go drinking let's go do this you know so i became the partier you know the joke was the swimmers can drink like fish and all this stuff yeah. i stopped going to church and um you know i started fitting in or at least in my own mind mm. i could quote become somebody so after about four and a half years of college i think i had undiagnosed ADD. i probably still do um but and not having a degree because I kept switching up. A girlfriend of mine and I dropped out after four and a half years, moved mm. down um, to a Gulf Coast town that we had been to for a spring break and just started living life there, had a job, all this stuff. She eventually moved back. I kept up the partying lifestyle, very rebellious. I basically cut my parents out of my life. I was rebelling against them. 
really against my own core beliefs, um, myself and ultimately God. And my friend moved out, another girlfriend moved in, she moved out and I was left paying the bills, which is a 20 something irresponsible kid. I couldn't do on my own. So eventually my very gracious landlord, who was very patient with me, when I look back, I'm like, boy, I was a selfish, full of rotten brat. Why was he so gracious? Came to me and he said, Susan, I, you know, I've let you stay here as long as you, I can, but I have other people ready that can pay the rent. So I had to leave. So uh, most of my furniture at the time, I don't know if anybody's ever done this, but they have like the rent to own furniture was like on rent. Cause you know, I was just a broke college kid that moved down there. So took it back to the store and, moved into my car. Thankfully, it was the only time in my life I had a um, newer car. And so at least it was running. It was a Camaro. Mm. And um, so what was interesting about that is I did, I did have a very real clear thought and I knew I could go home and I knew my parents would help me out. I knew they would take care of me. I knew they would forgive me. I knew that, you know, they weren't going to be what have you done? But, you know, I knew that they would, I would be like the prodigal daughter. They would welcome me home. They would take care of me. Yeah. But I also knew I would go back to that very small town and I most likely would never leave again Mm -hmm. because of limited opportunity, because of limited beliefs and because of who I was, I knew I couldn't be there and kind of change so there was this beginning of course looking back I realized well that was the Holy Spirit starting to work in me and so I had a decision to make was I going to call my parents tell them you know how far gone I had gotten and at this point I was probably well it's funny I've gotten old you forget I I guess I would say I was probably 24 or so so we're in there 23 24 23 maybe I mean I was my own person I was my own adult or do I stay there? Do I live in my car, keep my job? I mean, I was working, I had a job. I just didn't have enough to pay the bills by myself. Mm. And basically cowgirl up and figure, not not in that whole you can do it way, but basically own my crap, yeah. um, fix what I had done wrong and see just how far I could fix things before I would have to call home basically. So it was a very clear thought process. It wasn't like, I'm just going to live in my crowd of anger. So I can look back and see the Holy Spirit was already starting to soften me. And I realized too, if I did go home, um, and again, not that they would say this, but that would be a lot of shame on my parents. That would be financial responsibility on them. And I I knew right then I was like, "I, I need to do something. So I moved into my car, lived in my car, um, probably for about six months. It was a very scary time, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world, Gary. It was some of the most intimate time I had with God. And it was really this utter aloneness with him that I never knew I needed. So when so much is stripped away from you and you have nowhere to look but up, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And so up until this time, I had still been rock hard partying with all the wrong people, all the wrong crowds. Mm. I hadn't been to church in years, you know, and I would still have talks with the Holy Spirit, with God. I'd be like, not now, not now. What I realized now looking back is I was in the middle of a, a whole lot of self-hatred, deep self-loathing. I couldn't forgive myself for things that I had believed were like unredeemable, Um, you know, and there's some of that in uh, being raised certain ways. Some of it, maybe what I just believe from Satan whispering, but, you know, I think there are a lot of Christians, a lot of people out there who have done things that they believe they can't be saved from. I'm here to tell you, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Like God is the God who comes into the darkness. He comes down to the bathroom floor when you're down there, you know, People think of God as this God of light in this hierarchy or some sort of glowing light up there. But do we forget he descended into hell and then rose from the dead? Like he, it is not disrespectful to say he'll meet you on the bathroom floor. He'll meet you in that darkness and that shady spot you shouldn't be in. Yes, he will. That's not disrespectful. That's his awesomeness and where he's willing to go and chase you no matter what. So, During this time, I also, before I quit the job I currently had, um, so I quit cold turkey. I quit the partying lifestyle. I dropped the friends. Um, I think this 
I think cell phones were out. They definitely weren't smartphones. So I had like a little flip phone or something because this was like 25 years ago, you know. Yeah. So um, so I just wouldn't answer calls, wouldn't answer calls. I mean, I just cut it cold turkey and I knew that was the safest thing to do. Yeah. So those are the people that I think, you know, if, which I believe God can save them. He may already have. Mm-hmm. They'll be surprised, you know, to see me. Yeah. In um, I mean, I pray they are. But anyway, so during this time, I stopped the partying, I stopped the friends, I stopped the whole lifestyle. And my job at the time was I was a bartender. So before I could quit that job, because I wanted to get completely cut ties with the partying lifestyle, I needed to have one, obviously, Yeah. Um, because I was still making money and saving it to get my own place. I just didn't have enough to pay all those bills yet on my own. Yeah. So I found another job. I would spend my daytime when I was bartending, job hunting, you know. And, um, and then at night I would bartend, which was nice because I didn't really want to fall asleep too much in my car. Yeah. And so um, finally I was able to quit that job. And I got like three jobs at one time, just working around the clock. And this is not like a pull yourself up by your bootstrap thing. It's just, a, you know, there comes a time where you do have to face responsibility. You know, there's consequences for your actions, just like we teach our kids, right? Like yeah. don't touch the hot stove. You will get burned. Don't yeah. run in traffic. Well, I had done all these things I wasn't supposed to do. And I, I needed to fix. I need to own my consequences needed to check my game. Right. Yeah. So was interesting about this. So after the three jobs and working for a time, one of the proudest moments of my life was uh, signing my own lease on a low income housing apartment. Oh. And that moment was so crazy to me because from the moment I moved in my car until the moment I moved into my low income housing, and again, this is 25 years ago or so, um, was some of the most precious time I had with God. And he was so gentle. He's a gentle father. He is a patient and gracious father. He's not one to keep showing you your sins when you're busy, full of self-hatred. He's one to give you the love. Um, You know, when all the self-love is all the buzz nowadays, when I think of that, I just think of the Holy Spirit, you know? So if you are somebody like me, that's prone to be emotional and very self-deprecating, God doesn't want that for you in your life. You know, less of you and more of God doesn't mean, um, hating yourself because if my body is the temple of God, then if I hate myself, I'm in essence, hate, you know, so he doesn't want us to hate ourselves at all. Yeah. And in fact, the more you love God, the easier it is um, to be thankful for yourself and all your quirkiness and weirdness and how he made you, you know? Um, but that was a huge check your game moment for me. So he was really busy redeeming me from a whole lot of things. Most of it being the deep, deep, deep self-hatred. Um, And what's interesting is during all this time that he was redeeming me, I had so many thought processes going on of, um, I hadn't, I hadn't yet, you know, reached out to my parents and started to repair that relationship, but I just kept thinking, wow, God, if something happens to me, you know, in the middle of the night, you know, sleeping in my car, my parents won't know they're not going to know that you've changed me. They're not going to know that I've been made whole again you know, how can I help them know, God, I want to, you know, and so um, eventually that relationship would not only be repaired and restored, but be made brand new. Um, But anyway, that was a huge, huge, huge check your game moment for me. But it wasn't me checking my game. It was, you know, the Holy Spirit and God. And it was such a beautiful thing, because mine has been a slow process. But um, when I look back and I remember the parting lifestyle and how that was just, that part was quick and it was all of a sudden, I just didn't want it anymore. And I knew that has to stop. You know, it's kind of like when you see a kid learning to read, right? It's not like they can read the whole paragraph or the whole book when they first start, but they might, might read, you know, Jack ran over the hill and you're like, that's accomplishment. You read Mm -hmm. something, you know? So I feel like God was probably looking at me like, you're not getting it all yet, but good job. We've, you know, and I know he was my biggest cheerleader. There was a deep intimacy with him that if I were to really describe it, people would think I'm crazy because he was more tangible, more real to me than even the steering wheel I was touching. You know, he, so that was a huge moment right there. Uh, Yeah. You know what? Can I ask a question? Yes, please. I was just thinking, oh, I really want to know because I understand a lot of what you're talking about. I think a lot of people understand 
you know, um, we may not have exactly the same story, but man, things get taken away from us. And it's just like all the things that we chase to look for like happiness and it's all temporary. It just, it just goes, it's just quick. It just, it's, um, it's not peace or contentment. It's just, you chase it, you get it. And then it's fleeting. Right. And you continue to chase after all that until you're homeless in your car for six months. And then I guess I want, my question is, what were you like? Give me on the scale from one to 10, when you, before the, the partying ways, all that led up to the car, living in your car, where was your peace or your contentment? 10 is high, one is low. How, how much peace did you have or how much contentment? Was it pretty low at that point? Like you mean during the partying phase? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the way you felt, all that stuff going after all that. Oh, it, it like, was a, it was a negative ten, Gary. I was, I, I mean, I knew the okay. entire time I was doing it, it was wrong. I knew everything I was doing was wrong. Yeah. And the more I did it, the more I hated myself. The more I did it, the more I was sure God could never love me. Yeah. It was like I would go into these situations and I would do these things and I would know they were wrong. And I would feel God talking to me and I would say, it doesn't matter, God, because you can't fix me. You can't yeah. love this. You can't redeem this. You can't yeah. heal this. And so I was believing it was basically the only way out, the only thing to do. But no, there was never contentment, never peace, never slept well. I was completely miserable. You know, we're all chasing something in life, right? But what we don't know is it can all be answered with God, right? He's, he's the answer, you know? If you're confused, if you're lost, if you're alone, if you're self-doubting, if you're completely self-hating, all of it. I mean, the answer is him, you know, and he's so, the only place you can find the peace. So, no, I had negative gazillion. I mean, it was off the charts horrible. So I, I was thinking like maybe a one or two or three, but you're like negative. So after your your changes, you know, you're living in your car, the relationship back with God again, then where did that number lie? Oh my gosh. I mean, I mean like one to 10. It was in the positives, right? It was in the oh positives, right? Gary, it was like, I mean, my husband still hears me talk about it because this is before I met my husband. And um, yeah, it was like otherworldly. And so I'll share something with you since you know my book is about gratitude. I know my beautiful friend Wendy is all about gratitude. I think that um, a lot of what you were talking about with the chasing and the contentment, I think in this day and age, people, even Christians and well-meaning Christians, confuse gratitude with um, what you have, with where you live, or with your current state of whatever's going on in life, right? Like yeah. they think, my so-and-so died and you're telling me to be grateful. I just lost my job. You're telling me to gr be grateful. I just watched somebody die and you're telling me to be grateful. Yeah. But here's what I have learned about gratitude. Not only does it have nothing to do with your circumstances, just like joy, it's a choice and it's an indwelling thing that has nothing to do with anything external. And so, because I can't wait to meet that guy with the anacronym. So <laughs> well, Bruce Palmer. Um, Bruce Palmer, he's gonna be he's gonna be watching this, and he's got a he's on he's on checker game too. Bruce Palmer, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be good. He got an all things next because <laughs> I have another one to share, and this is um this is really what I learned when the peace and contentment started to kick in, and I was still living in my car. So kind of the flow of my day looked like this: is I would um, wake up in the morning, and there was this public uh bath I would go in there I would shower I had like one pair of pants but like four different shirts so it would look like a different outfit each day I went yeah. to work nobody would know I didn't tell anybody I lived in my car because I didn't want to lose my job I didn't want anybody to know it because they would maybe try to follow me I you know it was very private but yeah. one thing that I did is every day for my lunch break I would usually just eat one meal a day because I was trying to save the money if I would go like to the grocery store buy like one of those prepackaged you know probably horrible yeah. for you like the big sandwichy things or whatever you know yeah i would take it to the beach and i would sit and i would eat it and i would watch people walking mm. and it was the most beautiful thing to me because whether somebody's walking alone and crying or walking with their pet 
or a couple holding hands, God was laying in my heart, that person has been through stuff. That person has been through stuff. Mm. And one day this is going to be something you get to tell people about, not something you're living in, you know, like we were talking about earlier with the testimony. Yeah. If you're currently living in that struggle, it's not, not your testimony yet, but it will be, you know, hold fast to Christ and it will yeah. be. Yeah. But I started noticing things um, that I hadn't noticed before. And obviously it's not because I'm somehow special or good. It's the Holy Spirit, you know, he'll open your eyes what he wants to open it to. And I started to see God in things like in inanimate objects just everything started pointing to God for me yeah. and at first back then I was in still in that mindset where you don't talk about things I thought man am I just weird is that disrespect for sacrilegious and I realized no like every single thing in this universe whether it's like you know this coffee cup um, and this straw remind me of the vessel, how God brings, you know, water to our bodies to give us life or this computer screen of how we can see each other, just like how it points to how I can see him in the Bible. Everything in life points to God, you know, yeah. really, whether it's good or bad, everything can somehow point back to him. And so gratitude started to mean something to me. And I wrote about the footprints in the book, and that was from my time homeless, because that's when I started noticing the footprints and how they pointed to God. But I started realizing gratitude is, okay, mm -hmm. God redeems and then inserts true, unnatural, defiant elation. Mm, wow. And that really is what it is. You know, gratitude isn't a, oh, thank you for this computer that I can talk to Gary on. No, it has nothing to do with that. You know, gratitude is, in fact, a redemption and, you know, like we we're talking about with the CPR dummy, he redeems, he takes all that stuff out and then he mm -hmm. inserts in there and unnatural to us because we're not, you and I aren't naturally like, oh, we're naturally prone to complaining and grumbling, right? As mm -hmm. humans and as sinners, yeah. but he redeems and he inserts a true, unnatural, just defiant elation. You know, we're in the face of the world telling you, look at what's gone wrong in your life. You should focus on this. You're defying it, you know? So yeah. gratitude and joy are like this inexplicably <laughs> linked thing. Yeah, you know, um, I can't wait to, for the introduction with Bruce. That's going to be exciting. He's going to love to talk to you and watch this. He's going to be like, oh, my goodness, acronyms. This is amazing, yeah. you know. Oh, my God, we got to get together and talk acronyms. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, before I get to this advice question, can I ask real quick, um, the parent, your parents, did you ever get, you know, call your parents or when did you talk to your parents or how did that go? Yeah. So here's the good news on that. Now, I don't know why this part of the story is generally lost in my brain. I think, man, my husband really helps fill in a lot of gaps for me, but I didn't know him then. And I think it's from just kind of multiple trauma upon trauma later on in life. Yeah. But to tell you how good the story ends, because I can't remember, but somehow, yes, we got back together. Fast forward years later, my mom was going through cancer and I begged my husband. And so this is many years later, um, I, I, to be honest with you, I can't remember that part of the story and how that is funny, how when you get older and then these other things happen. But I want to share a picture of hope of how that uh, relationship was redeemed is that over the course of time, I would meet my husband, we would get married, we would go through marriage struggles. And then my mom had cancer, I begged him to move closer to her. So he did, he took a job that wasn't as good as we could get closer to her. It was cancer she wasn't supposed to be. Um, we didn't have our children yet. She did end up being the cancer two months after the news of her remission, car wreck, Christmas day on the way to church on Noah's Ark Road, if that isn't providential enough for you. Uh -huh. um, she was hit head on in the car and um, she would become immediately paralyzed. C1 quadriplegic, same injury Christopher Reeve had. And for those of you that don't know, our C3 controls our breathing. So C1, there's nothing higher, but your brainstem. So she lost it all. Mm. So, and she was young when the wreck happened, she was 58 and she lived almost 10 years to the day like that, which the doctors were like, we've never seen a C1 quadriplegic live this long. It's gotta be her care. So you know, just kidding. <laughs> uh, I became her full-time caregiver. My husband and I, I quit the best job I'd ever had. We moved in with them full-time because that was the only way we were going to take care of her. 
I mean, her ultimate care was completely life or death, like every single moment of every single day was completely consuming. So my dad and my um, husband would go to work so they could make enough money to pay the bills and all this stuff. We didn't have caregivers initially. And there were so many life or death moments. And I remember just praying to God saying, God, please don't let her die on my watch. Don't let her die when I'm doing something stupid, you know, and people would say, oh, you used to be a paramedic because that's also part of my story. Um, but the thing you don't understand is you didn't in emergency medicine deal with like vent patients, you know, this was not ours was getting to people in their most dire moment and hopefully getting them to, um, you know, more advanced care before it was too late. You know, a lot of times that didn't happen, but all that to say through my lifeguard and first aid training and being a medic and being a Red Cross health and safety director, nothing had prepared me for my mom being completely broken in her body you know nothing working from the colostomy bag to the super pp catheter to the feeding tube to the ventilator i mean you name it she had it so she would live almost 10 years to the day like that so the car wreck was christmas day 05 she went home and be with the lord december 1st 2015 and um yeah it was like literal hell that first year <laughs> my dad and i would tell you and so we were just, I actually just shared something or maybe it's going out later and I scheduled it. I shouldn't give it a sneak peek, but uh, mm. anyway, we talked a lot about forcing smiles during that time, because I don't know if you've ever done this, Gary, but sometimes you find yourself working and my kids will come, mom, why are you frowning? I'm like, I'm not. And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, I guess that's my concentrating face. I'll be typing. And I, and I don't realize my face is like, and you see all of a sudden, so maybe you me right now, angry. Right. And so if you smile, What's funny is it's, and there's so much proven like scientific and psychological stuff. If you force a smile, even it literally changes this and it changes this. And all of a sudden everything feels a little bit lighter. Everything feels a little bit more possible. And so of course I have an acronym for that. And this is one of my favorites, but when I think of smiling and not like a frivolous frou-frou, you're okay, I'm okay, but like a deep abiding, knowing it has to be all for something smile. Mm. I think of seeing, seeing more in light of eternity. Mm. You know, just like really choosing, it's, it's a fight. So I tell people I'm a joy fighter or I fight for joy or joy seeker because it is a fight. But if I find myself smiling, all of a sudden things feel right. It feels more possible. Things feel a little bit lighter, no matter how heavy. And it doesn't mean there's not a time for crying or weeping. Obviously, it tells us that in the Bible. And that's a pressure valve release, just like laughter and smiling is, right? But um, yes, we had a whole, you know, and my parents would often tell people come over. They're like, especially parents that were struggling with their like wayward adult kids the three of us would get to witness them and say hey and from my perspective I would say hey let me encourage you because I will tell you from my own perspective that what I was in the middle of my own self-hatred my own trial that was mine and mine alone that had nothing to do with my parents or my upbringing or something they had done or not done in my life that was me like I was my own sinner you know so those parents out there to be encouraged and again, I'm not bashing your kid. I'm just telling you, I was that kid. That was my stuff, my sin, my baggage, my relationship with God that, you know, when I go to heaven, I'm not going to go there behind my parents, right? Or as um, my parents kid, or even as a wife or as a mother, I go there and I stand alone before God and I'm accountable. So yeah. I want those parents to be encouraged. And then also my parents would get to encourage them and say, yeah, like Susan's not even the same person, you know, like, yeah. She's completely changed. God's redeemed her, you know, and so there is hope. But um, yeah, I was her caregiver for the first seven of the 10 years. And then we moved um, away for a job and they moved closer to uh, one of my other siblings. And um, yeah, but it was very much redeemed, very much brand new, better than ever, you know, had been. So yeah, thank you for sharing. I, I wanted to make sure I heard that part. And I and it ended well, yes. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, that's great. Because, you know, there's lots of situations where people where kids are, you know, I was off on my own path for a while. And I was talking to my parents, but still, I didn't really care totally about my parents. And, exactly. you know, like, we're just blinded when you're on your own path, doing your own thing. You could be saying the right things, but it's your actions. I know my actions weren't good, 
And um, I, my parents weren't my priority at all. And it sounds like, you know, you had that same path, but there's hope for those parents out there. You got to keep on praying for your kids, keep on loving on them. And you just, it's, we got free will. So they have to, they have to, um, you know, be homeless in a car sometimes, right. To, mm -hmm. you know, to open up their eyes, but thank you for that. And then the last thing I was just going to say, I always ask two questions and, you know, that check you gave moment you talked about and gave us a bunch of details and I'm, I can't wait to listen again. And so I can process, I'm a slow processor. I'm not saying that God didn't make me right. He just made me a slow processor. I'm fast at other things, processing slow. So if you tell me a joke, I don't get it. They all, my friends, they know, they say, they wait for me. They just stare at me, wait until I get the joke and I start laughing and they think that's funny. But anyway, my last question, what advice would you give others if they were in a similar spot to you? Now you've already given some advice, but just thinking, thinking back on where you were what could you tell yourself or what could you tell somebody else who's on the similar spot? Well, you know, I already talked about um, opposites a little bit. So I'm actually going to give two opposite, but not, um, they're not conflicting advice, but they're opposites and they're both pertinent. Um, one of them is, and I had to learn to do this when I was living in my car, because if I thought about like, living in my car forever I mean I would have just shut down who knows I may have become you know suicidal or something yeah but be sure and this is the hardest thing I feel like especially in this day and age with the dawn of social media and the internet try and fight for it at all costs to be present just mm -hmm. in this moment take this one breath and ask God for courage and wisdom and insight for what the one next thing is. Because if you can just focus on the one next thing, you may have just moved a mountain. And then the next thing. So I think just that kind of thinking of everything at one time and how if I stay here and this leads to that and then this could go to this. And then you picture like a diagram where all these possible things go off. And what's yeah. happened is it's distracted you from what where God has you right now. Yeah whether good or bad is not the issue yeah. god has you there now so ask him yeah. for patience and persistence on being in that moment yeah. and for the next thing and then the other piece of advice that's the opposite of that is um do remember this is not your forever this is not your forever i know <laughs> I know it feels like it when you're like in that valley and you're in yeah. that darkness and Satan has convinced you that you're alone and that you're unlovable or that, you know, you're stuck in the situation forever. That's not how God works. Yeah. You know, one of those Psalms that we've all heard our whole life. And I talk about this in the book is, you know, yay, though I walk, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I mean, I've known that verse my whole life. I think a lot of us have. But what didn't dawn on me doesn't mean it's not dawn on other people. I'm not some, you know, genius. And it's just because the Holy Spirit laid on my heart until I wrote the book was that though I walk through. And so the valley is not a stagnant place. He doesn't say, though I'm sitting here, though I'm stuck now, though I walk through through the valley so you see that's not just susan brown saying this is not your forever like it's it's biblical right we're walking through yeah. this is not your forever and you just you have to believe that and then go back to being present and ask god for the one next thing don't don't go off on all the tangents because you'll become overwhelmed and lost in that and which can lead to hopelessness and despair you know and that's not going to get you anywhere so remember you're walking through, which is, a, that means this is not your forever. Yeah, no, that's great. And then that's, that's for those who have a belief, you know, who have accepted Jesus, I think. And for those who may not know and are watching or listening, what would, so you can get that. We both know that people, any, anybody, you know, God, he welcomes everybody. You just have to ask for forgiveness and, and you know, invite him in your heart, right? Yes. And I think what's interesting, I didn't ask you about this when we talked earlier, getting to know each other off camera, but I don't know if you've seen um, the show, The Chosen. 
Yeah. But uh, my family and I are just in love with it. I know there's a whole bunch of people that are all like, it's not the Bible, blah, blah, blah. blah. Well, you know, nobody ever said it was the Bible. Um, but I think what's so encouraging and exciting about that to me, and it's a reminder, is that just like how we see nowadays, and it's always been some of the churches like, no, 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 this, 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 you have to do this, this, this. Um, you know, and you see the Pharisees, you know, on the chosen, and you're like, oh my gosh, yes. And then you see, the nobodies, you know, the me and you's. And Jesus is like, hey, Gary, come here. Hey, Susan, come here. My husband will tell you, I'm just completely like snotty tears. I mean, like mm -hmm. my face gets all, mm -hmm. and it's not because like, I think that show is somehow salvation. I get it. It's not, I'm not yeah. delusional like that, but it's like all the things I've known in my heart and you're reminded and it's kind of like the Bible kind of 3D came to life, you know, and you realize these, and you've always known these aren't stories, but now you picture like, not and not the actor, but you picture like, yeah, Jesus saying this and just the context of it all becomes so much more real. Yeah. And so I think there's just a beauty in um, letting go of yourself, letting go of your notions and seeking what God is, because everybody's seeking something, right? So if you don't know the Lord, and you're watching this and you're thinking she's some Bible thumper. Here's the thing is that I would ask you, what is it you're searching for? And then once you find it, what is it you're believing will happen? How are you believing that's going to change you? And also I would ask you very gently and with all compassion, not at all judgmentally, If you are believing that there is no God, have you ever been wrong in your life? Because basically, I don't know if you've seen this on my blog. I think you hit the about us thing. It says like one life to live, 100,000 mistakes before 8 a.m. Yeah. You know, like I'm constantly messing up. So I would ask you, have you ever made a mistake in your life? Yeah. And honestly, I'm sure most people, Christian or not, would answer yes. Are you willing to be wrong about eternity because my friend there's well let me ask you a question what would be wrong about just saying you believe in jesus and then even if you're intellectually going to explore it you know like c.s lewis kirk cameron those were big former atheists that uh you know went down the atheist track and as they started to try to prove how god wasn't real all it proved was how real he is mm -hmm. and so i would say um, you are loved and maybe you don't even know how to receive that kind of love, but you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. The Holy spirit will take care of that. Yeah. But I would just ask you if you've ever been wrong and I would just tell you to ponder that. Are you willing to be wrong about this one thing? Mm. The one thing that really is the only thing that matters, you know, and then talk to Gary, talk to a check your game person, talk to a friend, talk to a, believer you know i think um part of the problem is for people that want to know more they're worried about being condescended to you won't find any judgment here that's why i shared openly with you part of my story there's so much more to share um there was a point in my life where i stopped going to church long after caregiving i had so many miscarriages um one of them almost meant my life that i was convinced that god was punishing me for the sins of the past and then actually with that last one, it was right before my mom died. And my mom told me, she said, Susan, that's not how God works. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that legalism was still in me that I'd perceived yeah. as a kid. I'm like, no, I did all these things wrong. You just don't know, mom. I never told you all the things. I'm a horrible wreck. I'm beyond reach. And she said, Susan, God is not some baby snatcher in the sky. And I was angry. Like I wanted those babies. I didn't. I didn't want to be alive. I would tell God, I'm like, I'm angry at you that you took my babies and not me. Why couldn't you just take me like at least less? So I was very, I was again, angry, angry at him. But I would tell you also, if you're angry, what a wise friend told me, she said, Susan, it's okay to be angry at God. And I was like, I'm not angry. And she said, oh, you're angry. She said, but let me ask you a question. Do you think that God doesn't know about it anyway? Do you think he's not big enough to take that anger and turn it around and do something beautiful with it? Yeah. Well, what kind of box is he in for you? So don't believe the people just because somebody goes to church doesn't mean they know the real Jesus. 
the loving, compassionate, forgiving God who is going to chase you <laughs> in ways and in places you couldn't imagine, right? His light shatters the darkness. God will go into the depths. He will go into the seedy places that people don't even want to talk about or know about to save you. So that's yeah. awesome. That's great. I just wanted to ask that. Thank you. You gave some great information. I could not have done it better. Thank you so much for sharing uh, just a part of your story. Thank you. I'm glad. I mean, you know, it wouldn't, wasn't easy, you know, thinking about that six month period, but at the same time, you know, you had more peace. You, you were in the positives of peace, you know, compared to before. And I know, although it didn't look shiny on the outside, it was shiny on the inside. You felt good on the inside, you know? So that was just a start. Um, and thank you so much again. And um, before we leave, um, is, do you have any last words? Yeah, just, I mean, feel free to follow me on, you know, social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and I'm starting to get a little bit on Pinterest. Um, and the blog is the 365family.com. We have a little free gratitude guide you can sign up for and download there. And because it can be a little paradigm shifting of some things I share, I come to your inbox each day to kind of give you a how-to and walk you through it. And we're about to have a really, a really special release that I'm super excited about. And I would share with it here, but I told my readers they'd be the first. And so yeah. Wednesday night or Thursday morning is going to be the big reveal. And it's basically the culmination of, I feel like, uh, my life's calling. I've begged God since I was 10 years old. I'm like, how can I help people with this one thing? God, how can I reach people um, where they are and help them with this? And over the course of the homelessness and the paramedic and the caregiving and the miscarriage, and this has all come full circle. So I'd love for y'all to join me and share the, spread the word and see what is going to be coming out. And um, yeah. And I'd love to meet you and hear more about you. So I'm all about the people meeting and encouraging and, you know, just know that you're loved no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what you have lost, what is missing, you are loved and you do matter to the world and you are very needed by the world right now. Otherwise you wouldn't be here. So boom. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gary.